Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. So w- welcome, Ray, to the podcast. I've been looking forward to this conversation for, for a while now. Thank you, Bilal. Thanks for having me on your show. And what I always like to ask guests, uh, you know, before we go into the meat of our conversation, is something about their origin story. You know, where did you go to university? What did you study? Was it inevitable you'd end up in finance? And how did you end up where you are today? Sure. Um, I, my, my grandparents are originally from South India, or at least three out of the four of them. One of, one of them is from, from Sri Lanka. Uh, my parents uh, were, were born in Malaysia. So, you know, Malaysian of, of Indian ancestry. And uh, because my father was a Malaysian diplomat, we, we had an opportunity uh, to, to really live all over the world. So uh, pretty much from the get-go, I was uh, in a pretty mobile situation. You know, I consider myself a third culture kid. I'm not sure if you're, you're familiar with that expression. Yeah. I was born in the in the states in in DC um, when when my parents were were living there. Um, you know, we've lived in China, we've lived in Singapore, lived in Malaysia, and and for most of my formative years in the UK as well. So, um, geographic and cultural um, extremes uh, were pretty much something I, which was the norm for me, and I, and I and I and I got used to that from a very early age. You know, that's one dimension. Um, in terms of studies, I, I was always drawn towards medicine. I loved biology. Um, in, in my mind, until I was around 16, 17, I was dead set on on becoming a doctor. We have a few doctors in the family as well. Um, and, you know, with uh, with pushy Asian parents, that, that was also an acceptable uh, r- route as, at the same time. But, but probably around that age, I, I don't think I... I could get away from that entrepreneurial and that trader type DNA. It was always in me. I was always buying and selling stuff um, um, when, I, when, I was, when I was in my teens, bomber jackets, mobiles, all, all sorts of things. Um, and, and, I, and I realized that um, as much as I loved the thought of medicine, finance was probably something cl- closer to my heart, my passion at that time. And so I switched, you know, from wanting to, to read medicine in university, I, I, I switched uh, during my A-levels and, and, and I decided to go for economics. And in the end, I, I read economics at the London School of Economics. I actually met my wife uh, there as well. Um, so economics was my core discipline. Um, and um, at a later stage, you know, once I was uh, well into the world of finance, I also decided to, to do a master's in, in, in theology, Catholic theology, but with a focus on other religions um, at the same time. So that was a completely uh, different and out-of-the-box course, and that's something which I did part-time as well. So um, that, That's, sorry, that's quite long, unusual. Long Most people, when they do kind of a mid-career sort of master's in something, it's usually an MBA or something or something in finance, but theology, that's quite a orthogonal move uh, educationally. Was. It was, and I and I and I chose that precisely because, um, as as you say, it was an orthogonal move. It was different to what I was doing day to day. I think I've always realized that we are sometimes stronger and have a better perspective in our in our daily passions and our daily jobs when we um, inject with a healthy dose of something else, and that something else often has to be something completely different. Uh, so I wanted to do that. I was, I was well outside my comfort zone. I was attending evening classes in Kensington, you know, working in the city. Um, so ap- apart from that commute, the other side of London, I, I was surrounded by priests and other scholars who had already studied theology at, at, a, at an undergraduate level. So I really felt out of my depth, and I didn't mind that. Um, because that that was a new that was new for me, right? Um, and and I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot just by being in a very different environment. Yeah, that's that's great. And then on on the on the finance career wise, like what was what's been your journey there? Like which companies did you start with? Were you always on the buy side? Did you ever go on the sell side? What what's what's been your your journey there? Yeah, I actually started on the sell side at ING Bearing. So I was in EM sales and. Um, and I don't mean to contradict myself because even though I kind of knew it at, at, at when I was 16, 17 that I, I wanted to go the the trading and the investment uh, route, um, th- there was something about emerging markets, 
possibly because of my background, which which fascinated me. Um, you know, my sister was also there at the time, my bigger sister, and was it was kind of a nice thing. And I just thought, you know, what, what the heck? Let me let me give it a go. Let me try sales out. And and I joined in 1997, and of course that was just the the dawn of the Asian financial crisis. It's interesting. Most people um, I, I speak to these days make continual reference to the GFC in 2008, and and they're not even aware of the 1997-98 Asian financial crisis, which actually for that region and for emerging markets uh, was was pretty catastrophic, uh, right? And it was felt um, in in a, in a very deep and a meaningful way. So that that's where I started. And, and of course, because of the crisis, that that tenor was short lived. But it was it was an amazing starting journey as a graduate um, to be not only in emerging markets, but to be exposed to a financial crisis, to be exposed to financial stress at a very early stage in your career. And I think that can either make or break you. You can either just think, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? I should have really done medicine, right? You know, one year into it, and everything is kind of. Um, going pear shaped, but but I, I I looked at it very quickly, very positively as a, as a learning experience, as a door opener for other things. It actually paved the way for my my future investment career, and it and it allowed me because it was my my first and only stint on the sell side to really have, an even though it was short, an appreciation of what it was like to be on the other side of the phone, to be the salesperson selling to me in my later years when I was a when I was a portfolio manager, to understand their perspective, to understand their challenges, and to have a glimpse of the sell side as well. So I think that was a you know, it was a short but a great experience at the same time. And then how did you make the the, the move into the buy side? Um ING Bearings at the time had at other teams, uh, proprietary trading um, teams. Um, who were managing the firm's own capital? I was sitting very close to, uh, to a to a, a team uh, who who was really investing in credit, um, uh, global credit. A very small team, and they approached me not long after I'd left to see if I'd be interested in joining them in their next stage. They had moved on to to Bank Brussels Lamb at BBL, and and they said, "Look, do you know? Do you want an opportunity as a?" you know, as a junior analyst slash PM investor. And, and I said, absolutely, let's, let's give it a go. And that's where my credit investing career really started. Okay, great. And, and right now you're at, at sort of PICTE. And, you, you know, I, I guess some people may just think of PICTE as a, a Swiss kind of wealth manager, but maybe you can talk a bit more about, you know, just how big PICTE is and, and the different divisions and which division you, you're in. Sure, PICTE is maybe... Uh, historically better known as a wealth manager. It's 200-year-old um, history reflects um, that footprint. Uh, but in reality, the, the PICTE group now um, is, is a diverse one. Um, asset management um, in terms of size is just as large as wealth management and a very significant uh, player in, in European asset management, uh, not only on the long only side, but also as a, as a hedge fund uh, player as well. We're, we're also pretty large on the asset servicing side. So those are three large components. And there is a smaller but, but very fast growing alternatives business as well, which is involved in, in real estate, uh, increasingly now private equity. And, and we're also going to be looking at private credit at the same time. So um, the Big Tech group, goes goes beyond wealth management, but of course, its DNA and its and its heritage in wealth management is there and spans over two hundred years. Okay, that's great. And and you've obviously been in markets now for for a long, long time. Um, and so, have you developed an investment philosophy that you could sort of talk talk about? Sure. And and you know, my my role and responsibility is within the Big Tech asset management uh, side of the business. Just to be clear, and I'm responsible for the fixed income business. Um, but but I'm going to speak for myself. I'm going to answer that question in terms of my own investment philosophy, Bilal, because we are a multi-boutique business. We pride ourselves on hiring and retaining entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial teams who can have very often very distinct and very different investment philosophies. I, I know that sounds like a little bit of a, a, of a carve out, a caveat, but it is an important part of our DNA at the same time. Um, in terms of my own investment philosophy, if I were to distill it um, based on my experience investing in global credit over the years, I would say that investing globally was something I felt very early on was of paramount importance. It's very easy to say, invest globally. Um, you, you can't just invest globally overnight. It usually often comes from starting small, starting in a region. We're based in Europe. 
maybe European credit, and then expanding to Asia, expanding to US credit, um, it, 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 it often starts by focusing on certain sectors um, and then expanding. But why do I say that? We are in a world um, which is inextricably linked. Uh, you know, what happens to an oil producer in Mexico uh, has ramifications and, and is determined by, by geopolitical influences and energy uh, prices elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, I heard an interesting analogy recently in the context of the Russian and Ukrainian war. Is this the start of a, a, a deglobalization? And I don't think it is. Uh, you, you can't, uh, to use the analogy of that individual, you can't unscramble an egg, mm. right? And I'm, I'm very much of that belief. And as a result, I think with the passage of time, if you can develop that expertise, and if you are able to have a team who can connect those dots, you're going to be superior investors by investing globally. So philosophy number one for me, invest globally. It doesn't happen overnight, but get there. Have that as an objective. Um, Just on, on that global side of things, um, you know, often people, especially US credit investors, say, look, our market's really big. I'm a US investor. You know, uh, I want to become global, so I'll dabble in, in Europe, say. Um, now, what's what's wrong, you know, if, if you're like a US credit expert, like what what's what will be the challenge for them to to go international i i think the 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 issue is precisely the word you use dabble <laughs> if you think that this is um a free lunch and a low hanging fruit you're going to get a rude awakening pretty quickly um different regions in you know we talk about credit have uh, different underlying uh, buyer bases, different technicals, mm. um, different support structures in terms of governmental assistance, state-owned influences, and, and otherwise. And I think dabbling is is precisely um, an, an extremely dangerous path, right? Um, uh, 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 you know, I smiled when you mentioned the U.S. example. I think it'll come as no surprise to you that 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 many, um, you know, U.S. credit players can have a, ho a home uh, home bias. Right now, they, they obviously invest and know that market inside out, but it can often be, be difficult for them to, to transcend into Asian credit, into European credit. I think one of the advantages as well, uh, being based in Europe, is, is just as simple as the time zone advantage. You know, we're straddling Asia and US, and that alone lends itself um, to, 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 to really overlapping um, in, in those different investment hubs as well. And I think that that's an often overlooked practical point at the same time. Okay, no, no, that makes sense. Yeah. The, if I could, if I can continue the answer yeah. to your question, because there were there were two other convictions which are probably equally important uh, for me. The other one is investing across the capital structure. Again, if you can, um, what what do I mean by that? It, it's the the more restricted you are to a sector or sub asset class, the more trafficked that space is. Uh, the fewer arbitrage opportunities there are. If you take a corporate credit, for example, uh, like General Motors, and you're able to assess its financial uh, worthiness across its senior secured debt, unsecured debt, loans, equity, and so on and so forth, you have a much more holistic picture of where the value is on that particular entity. Um, I think we... As analysts and investors, we overestimate the financial analysis that we put into a particular company, but we miss out two very important points, which is where is the value, where is the best value across that capital structure? Very often, some parts of that capital structure will be extremely expensive, and that doesn't render the trade as favorable as it should be. So I think the ability to look across the capital structure is is um, is an extremely important one. Most investors are not endowed and blessed with that mandate, and they don't have that expertise. But I would say that that's an expertise which, if you hone, you can re be rewarded very ha handsomely because it lends itself to a more all-weather type of investing. And it leads me to my final point, which is a little bit related to that, um, which is be forward-looking. Um, so much of the commentary I hear by investors, seasoned investors, is backward looking. It's about the financial analysis which they've done. That's great. That sets you up really for the mo most important part of the investment journey, which is what's in the price. You can have a great investment call on a company, but if it's in the price, 
you're going to lose money or you're going to make very little. So I think the price you pay is almost um, more important than the actual standalone fundamental investment decision in itself. Of course, they go together. But um, if I could summarize, invest globally, invest across the capital structure. Those are two experiences which you have to develop and you hone. You can't just dabble in them. Um, but be forward-looking. Uh, what's in the price? There's a price for everything, but what's in the price? Yeah, that, that's that's um, that's absolutely uh, good, 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 great, great points there. Just on, on on the price, I mean, especially if you're looking across capital structure. I mean, do you find that often the liquidity could be poor, so you know the price is is hard to determine, or you know you aren't quite sure what the price is telling you? I mean, how how do you think about liquidity and price? Illiquidity um, can be a, a friend and not a foe. I think if you're managing a strategy which embeds, honestly, the underlying liquidity or illiquidity of those sub-instruments, then you, keep, you arrive at a very honest answer as to what the capacity of your strategy is. So I think that should be the starting point. Once you have that, um, illiquidity can work in your favor. Um, a very tight market, which is quite illiquid, can be very gappy. And that gap up or down can work very much in your favor, depending on, on, on how you're positioned. So, so, you know, I don't look at illiquidity as a bad word. It is just something which has to be factored in into capacity and the decision making, but actually it can augment returns. And obviously, you, I mean, you have a background in credit, but also in emerging markets as well. And so you're probably very comfortable with uh, illiquidity, I imagine, as well. I am, and I'm, I'm pretty pragmatic about illiquidity because um, a, a certain asset class doesn't have a continuum of liquidity. Um, today, as we speak, liquidity is perfectly reasonable, even though the markets are a little bit choppy. Um, but but you know, you have three down days in a row, and suddenly that illiquidity is going to halve, right? So you know, I think you need to be pretty pragmatic about the fact that there is no single answer on, on liquidity at the same time. There are ranges. And, and as we've seen in March 2020, just to use a fairly recent episode, we moved from um, full liquidity to no liquidity in most fixed income assets, um, including even treasuries, by the way, um, in, a, in a pretty short space of time. But, but fortunately, that liquidity returned pretty quickly. And, and in terms of actual investment themes that you're playing right now, um, you know, are, are there certain kind of bigger picture themes you're playing or are you more tactical, you know, week to week? I mean, how, how, how you, you know, how, how do you set up your, your portfolios? I'll answer that differently because, you know, as I alluded to, um, our, our investment teams are, are multi-boutique and, and mm. they will be very different. Some are long only, some are very benchmark aware, some are extremely opportunistic. So I'll, I'll maybe answer it because I think we're in an extremely unique situation uh, following 12 years of, of easy money um, and, and, a, and a, a retreat from, from that, that what's become almost a, a paradigm um, is, is proving to be very significant. I think it's taken the markets a few months to, to realize this. Inflation is clearly the most um, debated subject right now. And of course, the key question is, when will inflation uh, peak? So I'm not going to go over those points because they're being extremely well debated and talked about right now as we speak towards the end of June uh, 2022. But one thing I'm surprised which isn't talked about, I'm always interested in what people are not focused on, right? Uh, you know, I play cricket and I guess some people will play baseball. There's nothing worse than expecting as a batsman or a batter, expecting a certain kind of delivery, right? Let's say you're expecting a curveball, you're expecting a bouncer, but actually you get a, and you're braced for that, but then you get a regular delivery and then it gets you out, right? And, and I think the focus is, is quite rightly on when, when is inflation going to peak? When is rates going to peak? But it's very little on the second order effects. I see very little commentary right now on are we on the precipice of a credit cycle? But I think that's an extremely relevant and important question to be asking in the context of funding costs rising materially um, and, and by a very large magnitude. Now, you, you very often hear the argument that, oh, but you know, rates moving from zero to 3%, that's still extremely low in a historical context. But if you think that many companies have had 12 years 
of rebasing and readjusting the entire budgetary and pricing process to that zero interest rate environment, I would argue that it is the relative and the delta of that move, which is far more important than the absolute measure. Never get hung up with absolute measures. It's where we're going from and to. And, and you know, I heard a very interesting, I was in a conference in LA recently, um, and I heard a very interesting statistic, which, you know, I haven't, uh, you know, verified myself, but it wouldn't surprise me that in the US triple C space, all things remaining equal, if funding costs were to rise by 300 basis points from where we were in the beginning of the year, we're pretty much halfway there. Um, all things remaining equal, that would impact their net, net income and their bottom line by 90%. And that doesn't surprise me. They're triple 90, C rated. 90%. 90, 90. Wow. You heard okay. that right. Yeah. That, that doesn't surprise me. They're triple C rated for a reason. They yeah. have high leverage, right? You know, that leverage is, 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 in, the, is in the higher single digits rather than the mid single digits. Um, so for, for me, the question of are we on the precipice of a credit cycle? What is the relative strength of the corporate versus the consumer? Um, our defaults, defaults remain very low. And I think that's giving, uh, lulling people into a false sense of security. Oh, you just, you just froze. Sorry, that's probably my Wi-Fi. I'm, I'm going to repeat that. Um, I'm, uh, you, you're at sort of the low default rate is lulling people into false insecurity. That was yes, the, yeah. And and I would say that so these are questions which I think should be asked right now, but are not being asked right now. And I'm a little bit surprised. Um, but but ultimately, I just think that this is a structural theme around credit, the relative strength of the corporate versus the consumer. Um, I, I think I think it's going to become topical in the in the, in the weeks and the months ahead. And, and, you know, what, why do you think people are reluctant to engage with these sorts of themes? Like, you know, I, I'm kind of on the same page as you where, you know, the big story is that we've gone from a very, very low rate environment to suddenly higher rates. You know, you can argue about how, how high rates will go, but they are definitely, we're off the zero, sort of zero mark. Um, but what, why do you think people are reluctant to sort of look at the, sort of the second, third order consequences of this all? I think many investors are trying to, but but I but I, I, the reality is that this inflation dimension has caught has wrong footed many. The interest rate move has wrong footed many. So I think there is still a little bit of a hangover effect and a fixation on what has caught a lot of a lot of players out. And you know, one thing people do talk about on the credit side is that they say that when you look at bank, uh, not just bank, but corporate balance sheet, they look much healthier than you know, than before, than before the global financial crisis. So actually balance sheet wise, things aren't as bad as they, you know, as they look. So, you know, it, you know, we won't really have this sort of default uh, cycle. You know, I buy that argument to a certain point um, that, you know, maybe the cash buffer is higher. I think the average uh, leverage um, metrics, the median leverage metrics on the investment grade space, whether it's the US or Europe, uh, probably looks in a reasonably healthy historic position. But again, coming back to my original point, the delta is very important. And, and companies are rated um, um, in a reflection, as a reflection of their leverage, right? And those financing costs. And of course, if those financing costs are moving from zero to 300 in short shrift, that is going to impact and probably impact the lower end of the credit spectrum. So, I, you know, I do, I don't think you're going to get a raft of defaults and certainly not investment grade, um, you know, falling angels um, in, in, in the dozen. But, but I do think in the lower end of the credit spectrum is, is going to be particularly vulnerable. And I don't feel that we've experienced a material credit decoupling just yet. Spreads have moved, rates have moved, but the decoupling the um, um, the the under, the the repricing of lower rated corporate credit, I think, could be could be still much more meaningful and and, and probably in a, in middle innings. And um, you know, you know, I, I know that you manage teams and you manage the portfolio managers and and and, and so on. Um, so you know, I'm always intrigued about people's management styles. So you know how. Do you, you know, what, what, I mean, do you have a way of managing teams and people? I mean, do you think that, 
managing portfolio managers or you know people on the buy side is different from managing other teams in other other sectors i mean do you have some kind of management approach uh to to managing people in particular so how to distill a two hour <laughs> long answer into two minutes um thanks for that one bilal it's no it's it's a matter which is close to my heart i think in in the world of finance um whether it's the sell side or the buy side and and in my in my 24 years to date um very often not always you see promotions to managerial levels which are a reflection of investment outcomes and performance but little else um and 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 quite quickly you realize that that can be quite destabilizing to a culture and a team and and i think there is um you know the scrutiny quite rightly on management roles on team head roles um is stronger than ever and the expectation on those individuals is stronger than ever um you, you know you may have gotten away with it 15 years ago or 10 years ago but right now i think that is rightly viewed as as a as a responsibility and not a right and a privilege and of course you know that lends itself to a to a culture that it it really depends on the size of the team you're managing and i'm going to answer it in the context of 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 my current role i'm, I'm managing a large team of 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 comfortably over 110 115 individuals um you can't you can't do it alone right you, you know i view that as a partnership with my team heads and it's so important that the team heads in place um really should be exhibiting and adopting nurturing approaches to managing their team members um so nurturing versus narcissism right i know they sound like two very extreme words um but but you can get those kinds of behaviors in in our industry unfortunately as well so i think uh, realizing that you you're not doing it alone doing it in a collegiate fashion relying on other team heads who have that nurturing um mentality the willingness to be able to allow that light to shine on their many team heads is is an extremely important starting point and if it's not a starting point you really want to be getting there as as quickly as possible yeah and and in terms of you know what one of the challenges um you know i you know I, you, this is not just unique to to finance but this is particularly acute in finance is that the performance is is very measurable and very clear at times you know where you have you know uh, there might be a trader or portfolio manager who delivers excellent returns for a given year and at the same time they may not be that collegiate you know they may not be the nurturing type they may you know they may have a big ego but the numbers they're delivering the numbers <laughs> you know so you know often you give them more leeway or they're allowed to you know do things which other people can't do so you know and at the same time you as as the head of the team you know they they're delivering the alpha you know so overall there's a there's there's a a good uh, kind of uh, performance at that level you know uh, you know how how do you manage that that type of dynamic it's a great point and that's far bigger than me and and i and i think you know that that's one of the the many beautiful things about pickte and i know this sounds like an advertisement but really it isn't right which is that's precisely why as a firm you can't create the culture that unless your management you know that's the holy grail and that's what you should be aspiring to no that is just one route if it is suited to a certain kind of disposition and of course if you are a manager of an investment team you really need to be embodying both of those those virtues and those approaches but but having a culture which not only supports but rewards and gives visibility and prominence to specialists right is extremely important it should be an equally virtuous or applauded path to go the investment specialist route not necess- and to choose actively i don't want to manage teams i want to focus on the purity of the investment and the investment leadership and maybe managing a smaller teams of just investors and so on and so forth so i think having a corporate culture which um which not only strengthens but supports that being investment led is extremely important and I, and i i do think we have that here and and in terms of hiring uh, uh you know talent uh, so to so to speak um i mean what what do you look for you know in somebody when you're looking to hire them i'm always kind of intrigued about you know are there certain 
you know, things you can find in somebody to, to give you confidence that they'll be a good portfolio manager or, or, or was it, uh, yeah. I mean, how, how do you go about doing that? The quality of talent is um, is extraordinary these days. You know, when I think about our graduate uh, talent pool right now, I often worry that I may not have stood a chance, um, yeah, you know, back in the day if I was head to head with some of these folks. Um, really, you know, uh, it's quite extraordinary and they're pretty, you know, they're pretty well-rounded. It's not just only in academia, but the, but the range of, of extracurricular pursuits, which they are doing and excelling in as well. Um I look for for two attributes in that interview process, and I'm uh, really it's hard work and humility. And I know it's difficult to to cover that off in in maybe two one hour interviews, um, but but that's that's what I'm testing for. The kind of questions I'll ask will very often go a little bit off piece because the interview process um, will be will be again very collegiate. And, and I'm expecting a lot of the homework to be done by some of my other team members in terms of the, the baseline attributes at the same time. So for me, I'm looking at hard work and humility. And the other thing, which I think is quite telling, another H is, is homework. Um, it's as simple as do your homework on the, on the organization, go beyond the website, show that you really care um, a, a, about what the PICTE group is, by the kind of questions that you ask me about PICTE and PICTE asset management, I'm going to know very quickly if you've had a cursory glance at the website or if you've really gone around, spoken to your peers, uh, looked at different other um, sites and other resources. And there's so many different resources right now. So I think there's no excuse for not doing your homework. But ultimately, what I'm testing for, Bilal, is hard work and humility, because I think... Um, more people than the jobs available are qualified for the role and could do a pretty sound job. But ultimately, it's their character, which I think is going to determine uh, success and integration in, 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 this, in the culture here. Now, uh, actually, this leads me on nicely to, you know, more, more personal questions I always ask people. But w w one of those questions is, you know, what advice would you give to people graduating university right now? Not necessarily for them to enter finance, but more, more generally, like somebody... You know, we've just come off COVID, you know, they've just graduated, you know, they're entering the job market. What, what, what sort of general advice would you give them? And, 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 I, and I would like to get to, get to that, but, I, but, but just, just as, you, you know, the, the, maybe two final points, if you just allow me that, yeah. uh, that indulgence to, to, to round off on the last one. And I think that does tie in with the advice to the graduates bit as well. Um, the hiring bit itself is relatively and can be relatively straightforward. The bits around the hiring can again be overlooked. So the people you say no to, um, I see throughout our industry, a very um, black and white approach to hiring. You hire, you spend all of your time on the person you want to hire to woo them, but the no's are done in a very piecemeal, fragmented fashion with very little educated feedback. So I think the no's are very important because ultimately you could realign with those individuals at a later stage. So I think that's very important. It's not only about the hiring. And the other thing which we forget to talk about is what about the exits, right? Um, and I'm not talking about firings. I'm talking about exits where it, good individuals, and it does happen, it's a reality of our business, leave for other opportunities. And taking the time to understand why they are exiting. And this goes far beyond an HI exit interview, which of course is very important, but what's driving them, what's motivating them. So just to round off the answer to your hiring question, there are attributes to look for when you're hiring, but it doesn't just end there. How you say no to the people you're saying no to is very important. Uh, and, and being an ambassador of, of of where you're saying no from, but also the people leaving the organization at the same time. Now, I I just on, on the exit point, I think that's, sure. a, that's a really, really good point. And, you know, I've worked for a number of different banks over the years. And what I've noticed with some institutions, um, they're really good with people who leave and, and the people that leave almost become ambassadors for that company uh, in the future. You know, there's like an alumni type feeling you know, there's a loyalty they feel to the organization that they once worked for. Um, whereas there's other organizations I've worked for where when people leave, they hate the organization. You know, the, often the exit experience is so negative um, that they, they don't have any loyalty and they actually have a negative sort of feeling towards the organization. And they often become like a, 
I, I don't know what the opposite of an ambassador is, like a negative ambassador to, to the yeah, organization. Yeah, they're vilified almost, right? They're vilified, yeah. you know? Yeah. But it's such a shame, Bilal, that's the thing, because it, 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 you, you need to take a conscious effort to pause, not take that decision personally, yeah. and realize that there is a wealth of feedback I can gain from that that individual, which I can then use to help refine our culture and our our, our, organ, our organization better. And you bring in a, a very interesting point, which is the role of that individual as an ambassador. It's so quickly to lose ten years of good work and good and goodwill with that individual, and just ruin it by an ill prepared and an ill thought about uh, thought of exit. It doesn't take much. Could be a lunch together. It could be a coffee. Just taking the time to sit with that individual and round it off very nicely. It's a small step. It's far-reaching. It has huge consequences, um, and and it is a blind spot for many. Yeah, yeah. No, that, it's, it's great advice. Actually, I'm thinking a lot now about Macrohive. You know, we're like a young startup company, and you know, we're establishing our culture. Um, you know, and so these are some things that we really should think about. I, I think it's a great point about. Um, who you say no to in the, in the hiring process and not, not, you know, forgetting them and, and, you know, giving them feedback and, and engaging yes. with them. Um, and you're right. It's so easy just to focus on the hire, the hiring side, you know, that spend a huge amount of time on that and, and forget about the other sort of parts of the journey as well. No, th these are really, really good points. But Bilal, I, I interrupted you because you asked me an, an extremely important question about younger talent, right? Yeah. I, I guess you, you meant graduates, no? Well, yeah, yeah. So so let's say somebody's just graduated university, mm -hmm. they're thinking about careers. I mean, what, what sort of general advice would you give them? Lots. Um, where do I start? Uh, the, the graduate milk round, um, if I can use, I don't know if that terminology is even still used these days, but it uh, it can be a very disheartening process, which unfortunately, can look like a numbers game. Oh, I need to get my CV out to as many folks and, you know, maximize my probabilities. And most of them are going to say no and so on. And you're right. Most of them will say no. And they're going to say no to you, even though you are awesome and you're amazing and you actually deserve the job. Come back to my original point. Five people could be deserving of a role. One person's going to get it. There's one role. It's just a fact of life. You know, just get used to that. But I think in the context of that, I would actually say, be a little bit different. Instead of sending 15 CVs out, take a bit of a risk, send five out, focus on the quality, do your homework on those five institutions, know them inside out so that when you come across and when you're invited to that interview, you really distinguish and differentiate yourself because doing that homework shows you know, it, it matters to me. It matters to many of my colleagues. And it is a big differentiator. And it's not just rudimentary. So do your homework. Maybe focus on quality. If it means sacrificing um, uh, one or two more chain mails, do that and focus on quality as well. I think once you're in, if there's an opportunity to travel uh, with the institution, take it and go as far as possible. If you're European-based, um, you, you know, go to Asia, spend some time in Singapore, um, if, if you have that opportunity and vice versa um, as well. I think it's a, it's, it's a golden opportunity in, in a, uh, from a cultural perspective to understand uh, uh, um, co cognitive diversity even better. And, and, you know, there's a plethora of benefits. Um, languages, we are sometimes, like myself, as an English speaker, uh, joining um, an institution where for many, English is our, our, our official language at Pictet, so don't get me wrong, but of course there are many native French French speakers here. You know, one of my regrets is probably not um, starting to learn um, or relearn French at an earlier stage. So I think if you're a graduate joining um, a company which has um, um, other languages in its underlying DNA, even if that's not the official language, don't, don't waste time, you know, pretty much get out there and start relearning that language um, um, pretty quickly. The other thing I, I would say, um, which is very important advice is, as a graduate, don't join and assume that everything which is being done is perfect. Um, go in listening with open eyes to try and identify where the gaps are. I'll give you an example. Um, a company could be very good, but it could be very inward looking. They may not be looking at their peers as much. They may not be spending enough time um, with, with in, in industry peers outside you know, their own. And maybe as a graduate, 
you could compensate by doing that and bringing that intel inside. So just because you're joining a team or an organization, it doesn't mean that everything is perfect. Look for the gaps and see how you can fill in those gaps and bring that intel back in because then you're effectively developing um, an asset in yourself which is really complementary and differentiated and missing in the organization at the time. I would say, and I'm sorry, this is a long list, take ownership, when, especially when you're wrong. So taking ownership for your decisions is very important. But when you're wrong about something, and you will be, right, whether you're in your early stages or your late stages, put your hand up and say, look, I got that call wrong. Um, you're going to get a lot of admiration and respect for doing that. Don't justify right? So take ownership, but especially when you're wrong. And the last thing I would say is, um, you know, we, you may be bursting with confidence and many of our graduates are oozing with confidence and that's a good thing, right? So they have no qualms about asking for things two or three years down the road. But when you ask, be the solution at the same time. Don't ask from a point of entitlement, but also be the, the be the possibility of what those solutions could be. I would like this particular role, not because I deserve it, you may deserve it, but because I think I can add value, here is what I would suggest and what I think I could contribute and how I think it could benefit everyone. Here are two or three different options. So come to the table, not only with a request, but also as a solution at the same time. Those are some of the advice I would give. That's, that's great, great pieces of advice. Actually, not not just for you, for graduates, even for actually anyone who's 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 working. Um, now, I did I, I didn't ask you this question actually, which um, which I often ask all guests, which is, um, what's the best investment um, advice that you've ever received personally? Like, did you have like a mentor who sort of told you something, or you just read something? Um, it, is there something that stands out in your mind? There is. Um, I it it. it I don't even have to think too hard about this. It's um, cut and cut early. Um, you, you often hear the other side of that coin, which is you never lose money by taking a profit. That's fine. It's, it's a luxurious position to be in when you're in the, in the green and in the black, right, so to speak. Um, you know, your temperament around losses uh, and your relationship uh, with being emotionless about cutting losses when you've reached those trigger points. I'm not talking about too early. You need to, you know, as, as professional risk takers, you, you need to have an embedded amount of vol downside volatility, which is appropriate to that asset class and that and that and and those trades. But once you've breached those, there's no reason why you should be hanging about. Sell it. Mm -hmm. Sell it, do it emotionlessly and do it ruthlessly, right? Because then you will live to trade another day. It staggers me how many seasoned and experienced investors are still hugely deficient in this regard. And this is not me coming from a hindsight lens. It's a simple part of the investment discipline and the process. And that's why having teams which are not just dominated by a single you know, so-called strong figure is very important. You need a sparring partner or two who can say, hey, Ray, We've, we've hit that minus three. What are we doing? Let's, we should be selling this. No, you're absolutely right. Let's, let's go for it. How are we going to do this, right? Um, so having that sparring partner is important, important, but I think the concept of cutting, cut early, so you live to trade another day and invest another day is extremely important. Um, my own evolution of that advice, if I could inject my own rather than the advice which was imparted to me by, you know, by some of my peers and I'm still in touch with them, is it's easy to buy and it's harder to sell. So it's almost an evolution of, of that theme which I just described. Um, when you think about the last 11 years, you know, one-way bull market, if you were a stock picker on the long side or a credit buyer, um, I'm sure you made a lot of money, but you were one amongst many. Where you can really define yourself and define your careers is when there is calamity, when there is stress, when there are exogenous and negative events. Perhaps like the one we are in the early innings of or the mid innings of right now, that's when you can have a truly golden opportunity to distinguish and differentiate yourself from the rest of the pack. So don't always think about what you can buy, but what's weak, what can you short, what can you underweight? And it's harder, you know, I find when I filter the list of investors, from ones who are good at buying as opposed to the ones who are good at buying or selling 
And I think you need to have that symmetrical mindset to be a truly good investor. That list becomes much, much more narrow. And that's a truly great opportunity uh, to distinguish yourself. So I would say identify your shorts and a lot of credibility comes just as much with avoiding the landmines as it is with picking the, uh, picking the buys. And, and I mean, listening to another, another kind of uh, sort of question came up for me, which is that um, one of the challenges as a portfolio manager or trader always is what do you do when you're on a drawdown, when you're, you know, you're, you're losing money, um, you know, it's like psychologically, how, how do you deal with that? You know, you, you have a bad run, you know, and everybody of course has that, you know, that's just the nature of markets. Um, how, how do you not become despondent and kind of lose all your rationality during, during the, those sorts of phases? It, it's the hardest battle. And that's why, you know, you know, the biggest enemy, and I know this is cliche, is yourself. Um, uh, you know, you and many of your viewers will be extremely well-versed with behavioral, um, behavioral finance and, and behavioral investing considerations. So I'm not going to get into that today just because of the time we have, but that's precisely why, um, you know, it takes a rare individual for him or her to have that self-check and to regulate them on their own. I, I am a believer that you're more effective when you do that in pairs or in smaller groups uh, where you have that autonomy and you have that respectful challenge and that non-groupthink approach. And that's why it's essential to create that culture um, as a self-check um, because it's, it's extremely rare to consistently exhibit um, that ruthlessness and that coldness. It's very hard. Yeah. It's not impossible, but it's hard. And, and you know, in terms of uh, managing information, you know, we're overwhelmed with information. I imagine you must be as well. You must get research from everywhere. There's all the news, you know, feeds, uh, just, just, you know, in a large organization as well. I mean, do, do you have a system to manage information or research or, you know, some kind of productivity hacks or something? Or, I mean, how, how do you kind of cope with, with the, sort of the deluge that we have? The simple answer to that is, you, you know, the easy answer to that would be, look, it's time management, saying no and all of this sort of stuff. You know, your, your listeners know all of that, so I'm not going to go over that. Uh, I, I think the, the indirect um, dimension actually is the more profound one, which is ultimately when you're making decisions from a position of health and mental clarity, you are able to make far more decisions and far more decisions competently at the same time. So I, I think the, the, the perception that we have a fixed capacity is, is probably a flawed one. We're going to have on a different day, different capacities to handle different amounts of information, depending on our state, our mental state and our well-being. So I would answer that question. The biggest hack, and unfortunately, it's not a hack because it's not a quick fix. It's really one which is well-being focused. Um, so getting into dimensions of gut health, gut health linked to brain health, uh, meditation, mindfulness, cultivating those, exercise, sleep, diet, nutrition. Uh, really, I, I would approach it more along those axes uh, because ultimately I think that sets you up uh, not only to, to have the, the greatest possible capacity for making competent decisions, um, but, 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 but ultimately from doing that from a position of strength. No, that's, that's, it's great. It's, it's really important to actually go back to more fundamental, uh, things, uh, with, with this, uh, type of thing as, as well. Um, now on books, um, I'm, i I love always getting new book recommendations. So I'm going to ask you, um, are, are there any sort of books that really influenced you or books that you read recently that you want to sort of, you want to recommend? Um, it's always a hard one because uh, the, the, there are many, but um, I'm going to jump on the word you use, which is influenced. And probably the books which influenced me were the ones which I read um, when I was much, much younger, actually in my teens. And particularly for me, given this, this change from medicine to, to finance as well, right? So um, one, if I start with a, with a fiction, um, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, you know, I read in my early teens, um, are you familiar with this yeah, one? It's, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, you know, very, very good. famous Classic. dystopian novel, um, uh, which was actually written uh, by, by Huxley in, in 1932. And it's interesting because I think George Orwell's 1984, which is a similar um, 
tone and flavor has far more global prominence. But that actually came 17 years later. So I think Aldous Huxley was a real pioneer there and he showed foresight. It's such a disturbing and dark book. Uh, that's not why I like it, but I like it because of its visionary nature to think it was written in the 30s, 1930s, uh, so near, near 90 years ago, um, and really highlighting a world which is run by technology, uh, right? It's either a utopia or the complete opposite, I think has a particular relevance right now. So when I first read that, I found that quite disturbing. But with the passage of time and with every passing year, I always went back to that book. It really had an impact, a deep, deep impact on me. And, and I was amazed by the profundity and the visionary nature of his writings. And I think anyone reading that book right now today uh, would probably uh, be able to make um, extremely important links with, with the world we're in today. So that's Brave New World. Um, on the... Um, I guess nonfiction side, um, you know, and as a Bond guy myself, as a as an eighteen year old entering university, Liars Poker it was already out by five years at that point, you know, about the mortgage trading business, Salomon Brothers, with, with such a great and fun and exciting read, um, and 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 it's interesting because. Um, at the time, they were talking about, you know, the mortgage trading business, which was a new business for them. You know, these days we're talking about crypto and other sorts of things. Uh, I read the book. I reread the book again recently whilst on holiday. And it was an extremely different experience compared to when I read it as an 18 year old. It was a great book. It still remains a great book and a, and a classic, particularly as a Bond guy. And, and, that, and that might sound like a pretty meat heady thing to say, but it, it, it is not, you know, Arnie. I, I, I just lost you there. Um... You lost Okay, I, so, I lost you just at the end of Liar's Poker. So you said no worries. It's, the, 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 it's it's my connection. I was I was going to say the third book. Yeah. Okay. The third yeah. book um, is Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. Don't fall <laughs> off your chair. Um, don't fall off your chair. I, I know that's that's a little bit of a uh, of, of a curveball, but I spent hours going through this seven hundred and forty pager um, throughout my teens and beyond. It was. It was written in the late 80s, and it was an encyclopedia which effectively had every single kind of exercise you could imagine in the gym um, in training your body. And this book is far more than a book for meatheads. I know it sounds like it. Um, it, it. It actually, for me, was all about flexibility and adaptability, right? Um, very often you can go into a gym in a, in a peak time, and all the machines are being used you need to be able to think on your feet and think, okay, fine. Um, so how can I kind of create the possibility of training what I intended to train with other things which are available at the same time? And you only know that when you have those foundations and those tools at the same time. So I spent hours and hours. It's a passion of mine. You know, I've kept it up. It inspired me to, um, it inspired me to also travel the world and meet other famous bodybuilders and get, you know, wisdom on training tips from them. Uh, so I've done that with a few others, and and it was interesting to me because um, training with weights can can often come across as a very introverted thing to do, but actually the most effective way of training with weights is with a training partner at the same time. So this Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding, written in 1987, and you know, which formed a big part of my youth, was an extremely influential book for me, and it taught me a lot about adaptability, about you know, um, training with with others uh, and flexibility at the same time. I must say, I don't think I've ever had a book recommendation like that before on the, on the podcast, a book about sort of bodybuilding. So moreover, I don't think I've had many, you know, sort of portfolio manager, you know, investors who, who have an interest in, in bodybuilding on the one hand, and then also uh, dabble in sort of theology academically as well. On the other side, uh, you have quite kind of a unique uh, set of interests here. <laughs> Um, no, well, with that, I mean, it's been great having this conversation with you, and I know we could go on much longer, but um, but you know, we 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 have to respect uh, I have to respect your time. But if, if people did want to reach out to you or connect with you or follow you somehow, what's what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can't, or they can't with ease because I'm I'm intentionally not on a lot of social media. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm on LinkedIn, but I use it more as an information receiving. Um, uh, um, app, if you like, I'm, I'm not really active at posting and I'm not really on any other social media. Um, and that's quite deliberate. Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate of in-person connectivity. 
um, and and face to face. So, but but you know, I'm sure they can be creative, and and there are always ways. I'm not I'm not difficult to, to track down. Okay, no, that's 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 great. Yeah, it's good to know that somebody isn't uh, you know doesn't have like uh, twenty different social media handles that they they want to put some push out. No, it's good. Well, with that, I mean, I've learned a lot. You know, speaking to you, and it's been great having this this conversation. And you know, all, all I can say is, sort of, thank you very much for for the conversation, and and you know, good luck for for this uh, interesting sort of time in markets that we're in. Thank you very much, Bilal. Thank you for for listening to me and for asking me those questions. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.